Welcome. This is Exopolitics TV, and we're once again with uh, expert Loren Murray. Uh, and today is Friday, May 20th, 2011. Welcome. Thank you, Alfred. Very nice to be on again, but I don't think my message today is such a cheery one. Well, uh, let me see if I understand what what the message is, uh, and that is that you have found that, uh, in fact, the Fukushima tectonic nuclear warfare event of March 11, 2011, uh, which has now spread this deadly, deadly radiation throughout the northern hemisphere and down into the southern hemisphere, uh, and is implementing a policy of depopulation uh, was in fact monitored by international partners. Is that what you're saying or is there more? That That is correct. It was uh, rather shocking to discover that and uh, I also have much more forensic evidence now uh, that HARP was used on this event and that these international partners were um, conducting an, an observational experiment at the time this was happening. Uh, could you just, before we get underway with all of the details, just name some of those international partners? Well, it would be Japan, uh, Britain, China, um, I've forgotten all of them. Um, just a minute. Um, Russia. Um, I guess I'll get to it when okay. when we get to that yeah, part of it. Yeah, I just wanted to to, to see what what exactly you know the the level now now I know that 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 you've put together a lot of uh, graphs and, and charts and we'll be putting them up in a special slideshow so could you begin to walk us through uh, all of the findings that that you've found yes uh, just to go back to the international partners it's called the European Incoherent Scatter Scientific Association, or ICECAT. And it's a uh, leading world uh, scientific organization, or at least, at least they call themselves one. I, I think I would agree with them. And the headquarters is in Karuna, Sweden. That's where the, uh, very near the Tromso, Norway, a uh, harp facility, which uh, the partners there are Britain, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Japan, China, and Finland. And Alfred, this facility was founded, this uh, uh, association was founded in 1975. So it was right at the very beginning of harp development. And uh, Russia was also a participant in this experiment at the time of the Fukushima earthquake and disaster. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's notable because uh, Russia has the seven largest uh, uh, harp transmitters in the world, uh, bigger than ours even. And, uh, and they always have. So it's actually Russia that has been the lead uh, scientific developer of HARP, which is rather surprising, but not so surprising when you realize that they conducted very serious and very extensive scientific experiments in the Arctic since 1898. So, um, in order to weaponize the ionosphere and the Earth's magnetic field, they certainly knew more that, about the Arctic uh, than any other country in the world with the uh, over 100-year history of gathering data there. 
and the Arctic uh, nuclear bomb tests were conducted in order to inject uh, huge amounts of highly charged radioactive particles high into the ionosphere and then observe the behavior of those highly charged particles interacting with the Earth's magnetic field in the Van Allen belts. And that is how they were able to develop HARP as a weapon of mass destruction. And it's also how they can manipulate weather, climate, um, earthquake, uh, their tectonic warfare. It has, it has uh, a global influence, actually. What, was this the uh, terrible weapon that Nikita Khrushchev was referring to? Yes. But, surprise, surprise, the U.S. and the Soviets were secret partners developing it. So we, uh, we co-developed it. Their scientists came from the Soviet Union to the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab, and we sent our scientists with money and technology and even a 40-ton magnet to the Soviet Union and I'm sure a lot of the experimentation, it was done in, in these um, northern uh, latitudes of the Soviet Union, close to the Arctic Circle, where their heart facilities are. And what do you make of this, this recent video clip of Sidinovsky, of the Russian Duma, on, I think it was Georgian national TV, where he... Uh, re revealed, uh, you know, that HARP had done Japan and threatened uh, uh, any nation not sub sub subjecting itself to the big four, Russia, China, UK, and USA is uh, essentially toast. Well, I thought that was very interesting, and I did um, take note of that, but I, you have to always be very careful about media and what is on the internet and so um, it could have been um, a false uh, uh, network broadcast you know um, done in a studio and then put on YouTube we really don't know yeah kind but, of a psyops right yeah psyops but um, you know since I know that they have the biggest tarp facilities in the world and they have the power of veto on the, on the UN Security Council, uh, I'm beginning to believe that the Soviet Union and now Russia have uh, been a major, very major player behind the scenes with the other uh, controlling entities on the planet, and that would be uh, the British Dope Incorporated, uh, the British Royal Family and the Crown, which is the city of London, the international financiers. Well, of course, I think I think Russia really does have a, a hidden hand in this. Yeah, I mean, Zionism, uh, communism is a Zionist in in invention, and Zionism essentially comes out of Russia. So, uh, you know, there's a very close kind of historical and bloodlines and bloodlines connection there. Yes, that's true, and that's certainly the fingerprint of uh, modus operandi for uh, the last millennia, no doubt. Yeah, well, so, yeah, yeah, so let's get back to, uh, and, and also, before we finish this, this, this broadcast, I'd like to give people an update on where the radiation stands, and yes. because that is... Uh, utmost I know on on people's minds and there is an information blackout on this and also what kind of health uh, what kind of health data uh, and health measures and nutrition measures people can take but that but let's go on with this yes on May 18th an article was posted in the uh, technology review which is published by MIT in Boston, one of the two big military contractors uh, for weapons for the Pentagon and US government. And it was titled, Atmosphere Above Japan Heated Rapidly 
before the magnitude 9 earthquake, uh, which was at, at uh, Fukushima. And uh, what this uh, scientist said is that infrared emissions above the epicenter of the, it's actually called the Tohoku uh, earthquake, which um, damaged Fukushima and northern Japan, the, it increased dramatically in the days before the devastating earthquake in Japan. And uh, he posted uh, a series of very, very interesting um, maps of Japan where you can see the plate boundaries, um, the uh, tectonic plate boundaries. There are four of them around Japan or under Japan. And um, on, on, on March the 5th, you could see that um, the, there were heating spots uh, in the north of Japan and in Kyushu, the south of Japan, which is on the Asian plate, uh, subducting under Japan. Japan's just kind of float, floating or teetering above on the edge of that. And uh, there was also a spot near Hamaoka, which is south of uh, southeast of uh, Tokyo, and I guess southwest of Tokyo. And so on the Philippine side of that uh, plate boundary, uh, just offshore, they were heating there too. And these are uh, fairly round, fairly circular uh, heating spots, and uh, that would be characteristic of heart. On March 6th and 7th, there was no activity, but on March 8th, there was uh, heavy, uh, I would call it burning or major heating, and it actually triggered a 7.2 earthquake, uh, Richter scale earthquake, up in the, uh, the north end of uh, Honshu, which is the main island of Japan that where Fukushima is also located. So on the 9th, um, there was further heating and where, where that earthquake occurred and there was much heavier heating on the, um, the uh, sort of the Tokyo area, the um, uh, Kanto area of Japan, kind of in the middle of the, the big island of Honshu. On the 10th, there was very, very intense heating uh, up above uh, north, north east of Fukushima in the area where that earthquake had occurred and the 7.2 earthquake. And there was also more uh, down on the um, southern, uh, southern end of, of Tokyo next to the uh, Philippine plate boundary. Now, on the 11th, the day that the earthquake occurred, there was a uh, very heavy burning offshore from Fukushima and uh, slightly, some slightly where it had in the sort of um, uh, Chiba area offshore. And, of course, that's the day the earthquake happened. Now, what's interesting is there was more heating uh, more than any other time on the 12th. And uh, this time it was at the junction of the Philippine plate, the Asian plate, and the, um, the North American plate, which covers the Pacific. And that's very, very interesting because um, three of those burn spots were in a straight line, which was from uh, northwest to southeast. So this is... Uh, really, really interesting, and the uh, magnetometer readings at uh, Gakona, Alaska actually uh, correlate with these uh, activities that, that were measured in with the infrared light over the uh, islands of Japan, the archipelago, and those measurements would have been made by uh, probably five geosynchronous uh, Los Alamos satellites that were used to observe the uh, Kashmir earthquake, I believe it was in 2005. 
and um, these these uh, magnetometer readings are very very interesting and they certainly correlate with that data and what they show which was also observed by the Japanese magnetometer readings is a frequency of 2.5 Hertz uh, for a couple of days before that earthquake and um, that's the uh, that is the frequency actually that triggers earthquakes with this this harp technology so um, I think that we're collecting much more information and uh, understanding how harp works and also finding the uh, forensic evidence on their own sites to prove that what we're saying is correct right now uh, there is um, uh, it, there have been various accounts and people have been asking and saying that there were events in the Sun which correlate with the various dates of the uh, earthquake or events in other astronomical uh, uh, entities like the galactic black hole and I, I just want to go through and, and test for the fact that, that it appears as though the data shows that it was HARP and not these solar events or these other galactic astronomical events that caused the Fukushima earthquake event. Well, the tectonic warfare is um, actually designed to release huge amounts of energy that are uh, part of natural events. And so in an earthquake zone, and the major earthquake zones are at the tectonic plate boundaries around the world where the continents, these tectonic plates, um, uh, sort of meet or they're uh, marginal to each other. Um, those fault lines and, and uh, they're actually collision zones have tremendous amounts of stresses that build up and uh, they build up and build up and that's called the elastic limit and when they reach a certain point where they have uh, enough energy stored up to, um, to suddenly release it, that's called reaching the elastic limit and uh, that would be like pulling a rubber band and pulling a rubber band tighter and tighter until it breaks. Um, so what would trigger these excess amounts of energy in a fault zone? Well, something just as simple as a high tide, which adds a tremendous amount of uh, uh, burden or an overload, a load on a fault zone. Actually, high tides very frequently trigger uh, um, earthquakes. And now, these uh, this HARP uh, tectonic warfare technology is designed to be used on in fault zone areas where these faults are overdue for an earthquake and where huge stresses have been stored up and accumulated and that's how they triggered the Sumatra earthquake which threw the whole island of Sumatra 14 miles uh, I, I mean 14 feet uh, to a new position and uh, just the Fukushima earthquake which was uh, if you if uh, this is for a, a 9.0 earthquake I had Marion Falk who's a the one of the last Manhattan Project scientists who um, solved all the problems on the hydrogen bomb and made it work for the US I asked him to calculate uh, what the nuclear bomb equivalent energy was uh, released from the Fukushima or Tohoku earthquake on March 11th and he calculated it and said it's 1,030 kT kiloton nuclear bombs the size of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this is re releasing 
um, much, much more um, of a shock wave, a destructive shock wave that then a nuclear weapon can release. And it's great because no one thinks it's, um, they just don't think it's a natural event, an unfortunate earthquake and tsunami. And uh, they just pick themselves up and go on to clean up the disaster and rebuild their communities and their lives and their country. But um, in the case of Fukushima and some of these other earthquakes that we know are, are triggered by HARP, um, it's not a natural event. It's an artificially triggered natural event, which is a natural event that's, that's been weaponized for the benefit of whoever is triggering it. Now, um, the, uh, the way that they are pumping extra energy into that fault line to destabilize it, as we know from the magnetometer readings and from the atmospheric irregularities reported for a week over that fault area, and that also geologists around the world are noticing that that also happened in Haiti before the Haiti earthquake. And uh, it's happened in, in other earthquakes, which is not normal. It was not observed in the past. And um, so the, the way that they're doing it is to pump very intense very focused energy in uh, radio waves, these are L for extra low frequency waves, into a fault zone. And that increases the heat and the stress. And finally, uh, after about five days of these daily pulsing into the fault zone, they can trigger an earthquake. Now, when a sunspot event happens, that energy that is released is not just diffused over the planet Earth, um, it's also diffused throughout the solar system and also the universe. And it's not focused, it's not pulsed, it's just a random event which has always happened. And um, so it would not really be suitable for triggering earthquakes. Now, what also goes along with this is that it is the Department of Energy and um, intelligence uh, assets who are putting the sunspot theory out as the, uh, the reason for these earthquakes. Um, they're the ones behind the weapon of mass destruction. They're, they're deciding how to use it and how to benefit from it. So I just don't think uh, that's a credible theory. You have to ask scientists, not politicians and intelligence agents and uh, bank bankers who are really gangsters. Right now, uh, uh, there there was an international harp experiment uh, from March second to 9th at Tromso, Norway. Is that sort of like the like the drill exercise that they had on 9-11 uh, on the day of September 11, 2001, where they were simulating the hijacking of airliners? Uh, well, I think, I think so. I, I mean, they may have even participated in, in, in it. It could have been a practice for them, uh, you know, monitoring what the U.S. was doing. Certainly the signal was transmitted from Gakona but it could have come from other transmitters as well. Um, the, this was called the International Experiment on the Research of Ionosphere Heating Phenomena Initiated by Powerful HF Radio Waves pro Provided by ISCAD at Tromso, Norway. That's ISCAD is that international organization or coalition of uh, Britain, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Japan, China, Finland, and Russia was there too. Two researchers, M. Shevets and E. Dubrovsky, participated in this international experiment. And uh, they are from the PGI, or the, um, let's see, it's called the Physical uh, Geophysical Institute in uh, Russia. Uh, Murmansk, 
and they were certainly there. Um, I, I don't know why they would be there unless uh, this was of interest to a much larger community of scientists, but um, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting that they were there since they were partners with the U.S. in developing HARP. So, um, the Japanese uh, magnetometers were also picking up steady frequencies in the 2.5 to 3 hertz range, which led up to the largest March earthquake. Uh, this was the largest one in, uh, in the whole period of 150 years that Japan has been recording and monitoring. Uh, earthquakes. So that is the resonant frequency that creates earthquakes that the Japanese were picking up even on their whole own magnetometer. Now the Russia group, oh it's PGI is the Polar Geophysical Institute and it was established uh, October 11th in 1960. So this Polar Geophysical Institute represented at the experiment in Tromso is located in Murmansk, but they also have facilities on the Kola Peninsula, the in Barentsburg, which is in the Spitsbergen Archipelago, and that's uh, sort of in the area where the Russians did the big hydrogen bomb test to experiment or to study the ionosphere in order to, to develop HARP. Um, the PGI researchers, Shevets and Dubrovsky, were in uh, Tromso between March 2nd and 9th. So they were definitely there. The Russians, interestingly enough, have a HARP facility at Sura, S-U-R-A. It's called the Sura Ionospheric Heating Facility. And uh, it's also actually called the Sura Harp Facility, but it's obvious from the date when it was established, 1981, that it's 12 years older than the Harp Facility the U.S. has constructed or developed in Gakona, Alaska. That project began, began in 1993. So the Russians are definitely leading the research on this Harp technology. Um, now, it says officially in the Sura website, the Sura facility was commissioned in 1981. Oh, I'm sorry, it was 1981. Using this facility, Russian researchers achieved extremely interesting results regarding the ionosphere behavior and discovered the effect of generation of low frequency emission at the modulation of ionosphere current. So, uh, the uh, the American Harp ionospheric heater at Gakona is very similar to the Sura facility. They look the same from the air, and of course the U.S. project started 12 years later. Um, now that that facility is at Nizhny Novgorod, and I believe that is one of the places where Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab scientists work during the Cold War with um, U.S. science, uh, with uh, Soviet scientists and took equipment and money and, and technology uh, experimental stuff over there. Um, this, this international HARP experiment um, coalition, ISCAT, uh, has uh, a, a lot of descriptions about their program and it's very, very interesting that um, they monitor things like noctilucent clouds. These are the shimmering clouds that have been reported over the fault zones just before earthquakes. And they've been observed in China before the China earthquake. They've been observed over the New Madrid Fault in the United States, which were, people are worried about that uh, being triggered. That sort of uh, goes north south in the um, kind of the mid middle eastern part mid eastern part of the United States, sort of in the Mississippi River area, and that's uh, a very 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 serious fault. Although it's not going to split uh, North America, the continent, into two pieces because the roots of the continent are like uh, the roots of teeth. 
there uh, they go very deep into the mantle and earthquakes would not release enough energy to split a continent it, it might happen through plate tectonics through continental collisions but we're just talking about uh, movement along a fault zone uh, in, in mid-continent so it's not quite as easy to split it as something like Japan um, so it's it's pretty it's pretty darn convincing that um, these people are in partnership that it is harp technologies the plasma resonances they're studying are four to eight megahertz um, the uh, British also have one it's called spear s p a r s uh, space Plasma Environment and Radio Science, and it's located at Lancaster University in the Department of Physics. Now, their major projects are sub-auroral magnetometer network, uh, imaging rheometer for ionospheric story studies, digital all-sky imager Mark II, um, interferometer, that is definitely HARP, and a another sky imager so the group's main interest is um, it's in uh, European in incoherent scatter facility research and the uh, the Trumso one is owned by six nations including the UK which consists of three of the most sophisticated high power ultra high frequency and very high frequency radar systems in the world. And ISCAT at Tromso has the world's largest high power HF transmitter, capable of temporarily modifying the natural ionosphere for fundamental wave plasma and radio propagation. And they even talk about climate, uh, influencing climate and, um, and tectonic. Uh, sort of uh, environmental issues. Now, that that coalition, including Russia, as a guest there, were definitely monitoring what the U.S. was doing from Gakona, Alaska, in the week that the U.S. was doing the um, the heating over in in the uh, plate uh, margin areas on the east side of Japan. And in the north area where the uh, the earthquake occurred offshore from Fukushima, so it's certainly um, partners in crime, I would say. And it also makes it very clear that it is the citizens of these countries that are attacked with harp who are the real target. It is not militaries targeting other militaries. It is countries with these facilities targeting citizens and uh, I think it's a very 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 dangerous technology it's a very dangerous project they're embarking on and it extends to CERN in Switzerland which now has the capability to destroy the earth to turn it into a black hole to split it in half and so what they're using are Nikola's Tesla technologies which he suggested and developed and tested over a hundred years ago and the poor man had all of his intellectual property stolen from him ripped off and um, he died poor he must have been murdered in a hotel room because the FBI went in on behalf of the Rockefellers and cleaned out his laboratory all of his documents and experiments all of his notes and just took everything and um, I don't think it's any any accident that the south boundary of the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab is named Tesla Avenue because it's at at at, Los, at Livermore is where the Harp Technology Project was conducted secretly with the Soviets, and that was under the cover of the um, the. Um, Star Wars and National uh, Ballistic Missile Defense and National Missile Defense. Well, uh, it, it looks like uh, Tesla-based technologies are the 
fundamental technology for all of the black ops from from the from the heart black ops to the quantum access quantum access to the time space hologram uh, in terms of the teleportation uh, uh, black ops technology which is Tesla based and the time travel uh, technology uh, which is which is uh, Tesla based but but this new finding uh, of 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 yours uh, confirms what many uh, researchers stated, and that was that the that the uh, November 9th, two thousand and nine spiral, which appeared over Tromso, Norway, the night before uh, President Barack Obama accepted his Nobel Peace Prize, was indeed an artifact of HARP and not a Russian rocket. Uh, it sort of appeared otherworldly and people have said that it's part of Project Bluebeam and that is the use of the mind control conditioning aspects of of HARP. So so what you're saying now is that we, we really have almost various tiers. We have at the top of the pyramid or at the top of the tiers the kind of the puppet masters that are the that are the international uh, bloodlines to the yes. black nobility, uh, to the Queen of England, uh, to the Zionist, um, uh, to the to the Zionist bloodlines uh, at the city of 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 London and up through Moscow. Uh, then th that comes down to the various nation states. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, the communist nation states, because both Lenin and Mao were Illuminati projects of uh, the Skull and Bones project uh, through through Harriman and uh, Bush, Bush's Bush's grandfather, George W. Bush's grandfather, and and Skull and Bones basically funded Bolshevism and communism and capitalism. And uh, Mao Zedong was a a Yale in China project. Uh, You're absolutely and, correct. Yeah, That's right. and then and then you've got the the, the UK, and and the US. The, the the US is sort of the the main kind of battlefront or muscle for uh, for this. And I'm surprised that Israel that, that doesn't have a harp a uh, uh, harp facility. But I, I guess they're 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 the they're the trigger masters, or maybe the targeters. Well. It's not clear why they don't, but they may have um, privileges at these facilities. Uh, there are certainly uh, a lot of them at Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab. There are a lot of Israeli visitors, and we've had um, an Israeli astronaut on the space shuttle. So Israel is definitely part of it, uh, but it may be a hidden part. Yeah. Now... What, what a radio host told me just a couple of weeks ago, she's in San Diego, and when I was mentioning um, NASA and uh, Google and the fact that the two Google owners, Sergey Brim and Larry Page, parked their planes, their private planes at the NASA facility in Mountain View, um, they, uh, the woman said, oh my God. She said, uh, an engineer who works at that NASA facility told me at night, many Israelis come into the NASA facility. So um, the Israelis are part of it too, but it's in a more hidden way. Right. So how do you square that uh, with Barack Obama today uh, suggesting that uh, the Israeli-Palestine go back to the 1967 borders, which is what the Palestinians were asking for. Is that like uh, to to uh, secure an even playing field vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world, and is that just a different level of the chess game? Oh, I just think that um, Obama is absolutely. Um, was chosen and created as a black man to carry out this genocide against uh, white people, the whole North American continent. 
and that uh, that huge spiral over Norway when he received his Nobel Peace Prize was an ironic sort of ha ha by the the CIA or or the uh, this collection of uh, coalition of partners who are really at the top of the pyramid because he's their step and fetch it guy to carry out all these harp events and look what he's done look at the harp events the tornado episode in, in the southern United States Fukushima which will change forever the North American continent not to mention it will be contaminated forever with very 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 dangerous fission products and uh, while the military um, manipulated weather to rain for two straight weeks day and night along the whole west coast of, of, of North America, uh, certainly the United States. Um, Obama took his wife and children to the southern hemisphere, never mentioned the danger and never has since, and um, avoided contamination while he left the whole country that he's the head of and the head of the military too to uh, take their dose without a whimper. And not only that, the governor of California, Jerry Brown, who has already been a governor for two terms, um, his sister works for Goldman Sachs, and he uh, declared uh, a state emergency in a number of counties, I think 19 counties, because of all the flooding caused by the military rainout of uh, Obama's nuclear war on the United States. Well, it goes beyond Obama, but um, it, it's indicated uh, by his appointment of Dr. Stephen Chu, who won the Nobel Prize for Solar Energy at Stanford. He was moved to the Lawrence uh, Berkeley Lab, which is the home of the Manhattan Project, and received $500 million from uh, BP. Uh, he was only there two years, just as a holding place, until uh, Obama became president. He immediately appointed Stephen Chu as Secretary of Energy, and Stephen Chu immediately appointed a British petroleum scientist called Dr. Coonan. And um, so he's the uh, one of the undersecretaries of science, and they oversaw the BP disaster in the Gulf. So what is this resulting in? What this is resulting in is a chemical, a very, very nasty chemical pollution, contamination of the southern United States and the eastern United States, which will combine with this radioactive pollution that's arriving from Fukushima, very dangerous fission products, and chemicals plus radiation interact synergistically and multiply the effects of each other. So we're getting huge doses of ionizing radiation and very, very dangerous, more than 1,300, more than 1,300 fission products from Japan, and the East Coast and the Southern States are getting a chemical and radioactive uh, cocktail uh, in all their food, their drinking water, and in the air. So clearly, clearly, this is having a dreadful, a long-lasting effect, a terrible economic hit on North America, and that includes Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And this is exactly what they did to the Soviet Union with Chernobyl. They're using these horrific environmental events to bring about transformations in the geopolitical realm. Well, uh, it, it, it ju just to f follow up with that, with two kind of, of the Illuminati mouthpieces, one of whom was um, uh, former U.S. President Bill Clinton, who, of course, is a principal in the in the um, in the Bush uh, 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 doping uh, Mena, Arkansas cocaine gang during his um, term of office in uh, Little Rock as governor, and I think that that's fairly well proven. I recall very distinctly a scene where Barack Obama was 
first elected president and Bill Clinton was on the on on the podium with him kind of introducing him and saying and these are the exact words this is Barack Obama he's going to be your executioner that's yeah. the exact he says he's going to yeah. execute the laws but the executioner was the double entendre it's a it's a masonic yes. thing and yes. uh Obama uses a lot of that where they stick their yes uh, yeah tongue in their mouth yeah that's a masonic thing uh, uh, his tongue in cheek yeah yeah this is Obama this is your executioner now i'm thinking that that and we've talked about is is this not an artificial intelligence that's directing all of this i whole, i believe the whole that new it world is order? uh i i live in the city of berkeley and uh, the University of California and the and San Francisco State University, probably all the state universities, um, have been using directed energy weapons and mind control and social engineering on their campuses since the early 1960s. And that was uh, stated in an official U.S. Air Force report by a colonel, I don't remember his name, but I was not surprised to read it because I was an undergraduate at UC Davis in the 60s and the monkey colony there uh, has been used, it was set up it, even before the 60s and used since then to develop the mind control technology uh, in animal studies to be applied to humans and the, uh, the photo that I have in about 1964 of Nelson Rockefeller uh, beside Edward Teller at the dedication of the Applied Science Facility, new science facility in Davis, was exactly where the animal studies were applied for human application. And um, I interviewed uh, a man who was kidnapped. His name is Dave Silvey. He's written a book called Project Artichoke, which people can buy through Amazon, about his experience as uh, since his childhood, since he was eight years old, uh, where he was experimented on with MK Ultra and with mind control chemicals and with EMF, electromagnetic frequencies, in the safe house which was at Livermore and uh, Project Artichoke is how they created Manchurian candidates and um, that's actually where he saw Sirhan Sirhan three days before the Bobby Kennedy assassination at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles and Dave said I can't remember anything at that time but I am sure that I was there too Exactly. You know, I the, these are very rich areas and shows the 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 interlocking of all these events over four decades. But we actually have only about twelve minutes left in this segment. The time has gone by so quickly, and I know that there are at least two major uh, parts. One is that the contamination levels exposed by uh, non-governmental uh, monitoring uh, st stations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty show the, the, uh, that the largest radiation re releases were in the first week. And I wonder if you could walk us through some of this and also sure. through the behavior of TEPCO, the Japanese yes. power company, and uh, w within the time left that, that, that we have. Yes. Well, what um, what the only really good data that we've been get, been able to get is from the International um, Nonproliferation Treaty monitoring uh, facilities that have very uh, sophisticated equipment, and they can do air monitoring as well as make other measurements. Um, and they are non governmental, so we're able to get more information from them. And the Takasaki station in Gunma, Japan, in the north of Japan, uh, their, their reports were released by the Ministry of Education. And uh, their, the data tables of their air monitoring 
are extremely alarming and they expose the TEPCO and the Japanese government, the U.S. government, the Canadian government are all lying, the international agencies. And what the data table indicates that the largest radiation releases from Fukushima were in the first week after the March 11th earthquake. That's when the explosions occurred in Building 1, Building 3, where the MOX fuel was, Building 2, and then Building 4. And uh, there were extremely high levels, March 15th and 16th, reported in the data. But the data for March 14th to 15th is missing. And that was when the explosion occurred in the Reactor 3 the MOX fuel pool. And um, there were uh, the first increased radiation levels were detected after March, March 14th. So there was some kind of very, very large event in reactor three that did not occur in the other reactors uh, explosions. Now, there were some releases of radioactive iodine and radioactive cesium on March 19th. There were more releases of radiation on March 21st, 30th, April 18th, and those were probably related to activities that they were doing uh, to try to respond. TEPCO was trying to respond uh, to an absolutely impossible disaster. Uh, it's not only is every reactor much larger than Chernobyl, but there are six of them and there were 600 spent fuel rods in cooling pools. So um, this is the greatest radiation disaster in the history of the world. And, um, and people don't even know about it. Now, on March 16th, that's the only time that huge amounts of iodine-135 were released. The half-life is less than 10 hours. So there had to be a nuclear event, and that coincided with the explosion at uh, Reactor 3. Uh, Mr. Hiro Hiroaki Koide from Kyoto University mentioned this mysterious iodine-135. There was so, the levels were so high, the Takasaki station couldn't even measure it. It went off scale, and um, the uh, the result is that he said the huge amount of iodine-135 supports the speculation of a nuclear explosion at the number three reactor on March 14th. And we know now that it was in the spent fuel pool. The um, land surface contamination now from this data table indicates cesium-137 as high as 80 curies or 3 million becquerels uh, per square kilometer in Iatate Village, which is 37 kilometers or about 25 miles from Fukuoka, and levels as high as 1.4 curies uh, per square kilometer in Chiba, which is 220 kilometers from Fukushika, Fukushima. So that's uh, that's about a, a 130 or 40 miles. Uh, this is horrendous. And the proof that this is getting into all of the plant material and contaminating the whole environment and it's supporting the fact that all of northern Japan should be evacuated because a professor, um, Bin Mori of Tokyo University Graduate School of Agricultural and Life Sciences, uh, provided rate auto radiographs on his blog of dandelion leaves um, and this actually shows the particles of radioactive materials that landed on the leaves. And this is supporting the evidence and the reality that it's landing on all our food here in the United States, too. Now, let, so, let, let me ask you a, a, a question there. Um, two, two questions. Number one, is radiation still coming over yes. and being directed? Yes. Uh, through the troposphere yes. to North yes. America and into the yes. Northern Hemisphere. Yes. 
Yes. And, and, and we also have a debris island of tsunami debris. It's at least 40 miles across. The Navy observed it. That is all of the building materials and cars and trucks and even whole houses bobbing along in the Pacific. It's all contaminated with radiation. Right. And it will be washing up on our shorelines and then the shorelines of Hawaii. The whole North American coastline up to the Aleutians will be contaminated uh, for years by this radioactive trash that will be floating up onto our beaches and uh, we, won't, we won't even want to be taking our children to beaches along the West Coast, much less eating anything out of the Pacific Ocean. Now, uh, uh, these, are, these are just horrible facts, but I, I want to get them out on the record. In terms of the radiation released, uh, we know that there was a huge cover-up at Chernobyl that was intended as a kill shot for the Soviet Union and that about, about a million people have died. That's correct. Uh, perhaps more. Uh, in terms of Fukushima, uh, do you have an estimate of the radiation that has been brought over to North America and to the Northern Hemisphere and released in and is continuing to be released into the northern hemisphere. Are we talking a million atom bombs? Are we talking what? Like, is this a kill shot for North America? Is this is a kill shot for North America. This is contaminating all of the Japanese agriculture, food sources, drinking water, agricultural water, all of North America from Canada to Mexico, including Hawaii, and it, it's it's uh, radioactive isotopes that have okay, half-lives of uh, millions of years. Can, can you quantify the amount of radiation? For example... More than was, Chernobyl. Other than that, I can't possibly it, it, quantify it's, it. it. It's what, sorry? We don't, we, we don't know yet. Yeah. Um, we don't know yet. It's... Um, we have so little data, it's very, it would be impossible to estimate now, but we do know it's more than Chernobyl. So it's at least six Chernobyls plus plutonium. Yeah. Yeah, and, and each of the units was larger than the Chernobyl plant. That's correct, but and, see, they didn't, Chernobyl did not blow up the fuel, the spent fuel rods. Right. This is what makes uh, Fukushima so much more dangerous and so, so different. So it, it could be a thousand Chernobyls. It could be, it could be, we have no idea. We just have no idea. And then okay. it'll start now, washing now, up on the shoreline. Why is it that that question, which is a crucial question, is not being addressed? on either side of the fence. I mean, Because they don't want to answer it. They no, no, want to right? dose us first and then tell us later. Yeah. They don't want us to know. Now, can, can, can anybody in the alternative analysis community, part of the resistance of the population, you know, we are the people's army. We are the people. Is there anybody on our side that can address that question and answer it within X degree of certainty. So we, we know the ballpark that we're dealing with. Is it a thousand Chernobyls? Is it, you know, a million? Oh, I know exactly who knows. Dr. Chu and Dr. Kunin, they planned this. They pulled it off and they're covering it up. And they're also directing TEPCO in what to do, along with General Electric. When are we going to begin to see a die-off of the North American population? Well, the Japanese, uh, uh, within 60 miles or 90 miles of Fukushima, the teachers already have reporting, they're reporting um, radiation disease and rashes on their skin. They are already having, exhibiting radiation sickness. And what we'll see immediately is a drop in fertility in North America of at least one child per woman in one year. Now, there was that motion picture Zardoff, Zardos, uh, starring Sean Connery. 
that may have been an Illuminati foreshadowing of the Fukushima event. And that is where it's a post-apocalyptic world. The world is, the human population is radiated and they are uh, turning into all of their, their features have been uh, affected by radiation and their breeding so that they're they're kind of those they're kind of hybrids affected by radiation do you think that the humans in the northern hemisphere 10 years down the road or how many years down the road will it be before the humans are affected they're already affected we'll see a big decline in infant mortality this year in North America, because you mean a, radiation. A big decline in infant mortality? In, a, a big, big decline in. Can I explain yeah, it? Yeah. We'll have a. We'll see a big decline in infant mortality in 2011, 2012, because the women who are pregnant in their first weeks of pregnancy, uh, 80% of those embryos that are exposed to even low levels of radiation will either be uh, aborted or reabsorbed by the woman's body. So that will decrease the number of babies born, but it also will kill the weaker babies out of the, uh, the embryos in the first, say, three or four weeks that uh, lo a lot of women don't even know they're pregnant when they go through the airport scanners. When they uh, live near nuclear power plants, they have trouble carrying babies. They lose their babies. This is why. Or they don't even know they're pregnant and they're unpregnant before they even know pre they're pregnant. Now, the, uh, the new film called uh, After the Apocalypse is a documentary film that was premiered in London on March 11th. This is the reality. This is the documentary of that film, Zardos, that you were talking about. This is the reality of all the nuclear bomb tests that were conducted in Kazakhstan at Semipalatinsk and what the people look like now. And it is exactly what Zardov was, uh, was made about in a fictional sense but this is reality, and this is what North America is going to look like in, in time. Um, we will see more and more people with mixed sexual um, aspects. Uh, we'll see higher sterility and infertility. We will see feminized men and masculinized women because... Um, these uh, hormone and estrogen effects of radiation are very subtle, but they're, they're already being expressed. I saw them in Portland, Oregon a month ago. Um, there were women at, at meetings that I went to had, who had beards and mustaches, and women with um, physiques and bodies like men, and men who were very feminine. So it's already happening. All you have to do is go now to cities that uh, are close to nuclear facilities and certainly Portland is on the Columbia River which is completely contaminated by Hanford Nuclear Weapons Lab and by the um, nuclear power plant, the Trojan reactor that was on the Columbia River. It's turned off now. But, but it's feminized the men and masculinized the women already, and you can see it everywhere. Right. And one, and one final question, <clears throat> which just kind of struck me, because the fact that that documentary screened on March 11th seems like too coincidental. It's not a coincidence. And remember... That was Russian bomb testing in Kazakhstan. The Mongolians have told me now that the Chinese did nuclear bomb tests in Mongolia. And the Chinese now are growing potatoes for the Mongolian food supply in their nuclear test site 
so that they're feeding and selling uh, radioactive potatoes to Mongolians. And it's all about depopulation in Kazakhstan and in Mongolia. And this Mongolian woman said, I'm not from Mongolia. I'm from Miningolia. And a woman from Mongolia a few years ago went to the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab for two years. Who knows what she was doing? But she went back to Mongolia and started a whole uranium uranium mining industry in Mongolia. And the whole environment is being contaminated just like we did, or I should say the British bankers did, with um, the Indian reservations in the southwest where they poisoned the whole Navajo reservation with uh, uranium mining activities. So now, and now what we have is we have documented proof uh, starting with the top tier of the Zionist bankers and the City of London bankers and the royal bloodlines in the uh, in the black nobility and the British aristocracy and crown now coming down uh, to all of the major nations which are just kind of shills for them are in fact that leadership, uh, uh, which is an, an Illuminati uh, le le leadership and part of the Illuminati pyramid, uh, fascism and communism are up, all up just under uh, Aleister Crowley. Uh, all of those are carrying out uh, the depopulation programs put in motion uh, by the Rockefellers prior to Hitler and uh, ad adopted by the British Crown and and according to the Zionist plans uh, the Zionist bloodline plans and it's all through radiation that's and that seems like a future to you do you see any bright light coming out of there well, I was in denial for eight years. I thought this was all an accident, but two years ago I got completely converted when I did a search uh, on Google for the University of California plus Skull and Bones. And that took me tri straight to the bankers, the nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, depopulation. It's all for the bankers and the British Crown and, and, and other uh, royal thrones in Europe and around the world and it's no accident that most harp facilities are located by very large mining projects over the next century for British owned mining companies. So basically they're carrying out the project of reducing the population of this planet like the Georgia Guystone say to about 500 million and a master-slave class system. Well, I don't know about the, the, the Georgia Guidestones, but um, you don't need those to see it and figure it out. It's, uh, uh, I've looked at the decline in fertility in Iran. Iran is in a secret nuclear war carried out from Afghanistan and Iraq, and the monsoon continually rains out or snows out more and more radiation into Iran. Now, Iran had very large families. The women had eight or more children. That was the average size of the family in Iran um, in 1986. One year after Chernobyl, it dropped by one child to seven children. But today, after 20 years of uranium wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Yugoslavia, the fertility rate of Iranian women is less than 1.6 children. That population, like the Japanese population, is going extinct, and that is also what's happening in Israel to the Jewish population. They are decreasing, their birth rate is lower than their death rate, while the Palestinian population is increasing. So they've nuked themselves and all we have to do is sit and wait. Well, um, on that note, uh, let we're um, come 
come to the end. We've we've gone a bit over, but we've 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 come to the end of this segment. Uh, uh, sitting and waiting uh, goes against the grain of many of us who, at least, if we're going to sit, let's stay as healthy as we can and as alert as we can. So we'd like to invite you back for a special program to to look at uh, just lifestyle changes and consciousness changes that we all should engage in uh, in this uh, new uh, what should we call it the the brave new world of ionizing radiation. Thank you very much, Loren. Thank you.